Part two, chapter seven of En Route by Jorical Heismans, translated by Charles Keegan Paul. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At seven o'clock, just as he was preparing to eat his bread, Durtal encountered Father Etienne. Father, he said, tomorrow is Tuesday. The time of my retreat has expired, and I am going. How should I order a carriage for Saint Landry? The monk smiled. When the postman brings the letters, I can charge him with the commission. But let us see. Are you in a great hurry to leave us? No, but I would not trespass. Listen, since you are so well broken into the life at La Trappe, stay here two days more. The father procurator must go to settle a dispute at Saint Landry. He will take you to the station in our carriage. So you will avoid some expense, and the journey hence to the railroad will seem to you less long, since there will be two of you. Durtal accepted, and as it rained, he went up to his room. It is strange, he said as he sat down, how impossible one finds it in a cloister to read a book. One wants nothing. One thinks of God by himself, and not by the volumes which speak about him. Mechanically, he had taken up from a heap of books one in octavo, which he had found on his table the day he took possession of his cell. It bore the title Manresa, or the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, he had already run through the work at Paris, and the pages which he turned over afresh did not change the harsh, almost hostile opinion which he had retained of this book. The fact is that these exercises leave no initiative to the soul. They consider it as a soft paste good to run into a mould. They show it no horizon, no sky. Instead of trying to stretch it and make it greater, they make it smaller deliberately. They put it back into the cases of their wafer box, nourish it only on faded trifles, on dry nothings. This Japanese culture of deformed toes which remain dwarf, this Chinese deformation of children planted in pots, horrified Durtal, who closed the volume. He opened another, the Introduction to the Devout Life by saint Francis de Sales. Certainly he found no need to read it again, in spite of its affectations and its good nature, at first charming, but which ends by making you sick by making the soul sticky with sweets with liqueurs in them and lollipops. In a word, that work so much praised by Catholics was a julep scented with bergamot and ambergris. It was like a fine handkerchief shaken in a church in which a musty smell of incense remained. But the man himself, the Bishop Saint Francis de Sales, was suggestive. With his name was called up the whole mystical history of the 17th century and Durtal recalled the memories he had kept of the religious life of that time. There were then in the church two currents. That of the high mysticism, as it was called, originating from St. Teresa and St. John of the Cross, and this current was concentrated on Marie Guyon. Another was that of so-called temperate mysticism, of which the adepts were St. Francis de Sales and his friend the celebrated Baroness de Chantal. It was naturally this second current which triumphed, Jesus, putting himself within the reach of drawing-rooms, descending to the level of women of the world, a moderate and proper Jesus, only dealing with the soul of his creature just enough to give it one attraction the more, this elegant Jesus became all the fashion. But Madame Guillon, whose source was above all Saint Teresa, who taught the mystical theory of love and familiar intercourse with heaven, raised the opposition of the whole clergy who abominated mysticism without understanding it. She exasperated the terrible Bossuet, who accused her of the fashionable heresy, Molinism and Quietism. She refuted, unhappy as she was, this trouble without much difficulty, but he persecuted her for it none the less. He was furious against her, and had her imprisoned at Vincennes, revealed himself obstinate, surly and atrocious. Fenelon, who tried to conciliate these two tendencies in preparing a small mysticism neither too hot nor too cold, a little less lukewarm than that of Saint Francis de Sales, and above all things much less ardent than that of St. Teresa, ended in his turn by displeasing the cormorant of Meaux, and though he abandoned and denied Madame de Guillon, whose friend he had been for long years, he was persecuted and tracked down by Bossuet, condemned at Rome, and sent in exile to Cambrai. And here Durtal could not but smile, for he remembered the desolate complaints of his partisans weeping for this disgrace representing thus as a martyr this archbishop whose punishment consisted in quitting his post as courtier at versailles to go at last and administer his diocese in which he appeared till then to have never resided this mitred job 
who remained in his misfortune archbishop and duke of cambrai prince of the holy roman empire and rich so unhappy because he was obliged to visit his flock well shows the state of the episcopate under the redundant reign of the great king it was a priesthood of financiers and valets only there was at any rate a certain attraction there was talent in every case while now bishops are not for the most part less intriguing nor less servile but they have no longer either talent or manners caught in part in the fish pond of bad priests they show themselves ready for everything and turn out to be souls of old usurers low jobbers beggars when you press them it is sad to say it but so it is concluded durtal as for madame guillon he went on she was neither an original writer nor a saint she was only an unwelcome substitute for the true mystics she was presuming and certainly lacked that humility which magnified saint teresa and saint claire but after all she burst into a flame she was overcome by jesus above all she was not a pious courtier a bigot softened by a court like the maintenon after all what a time for religion it was all its saints have something formal and restricted wordy and cold which turns me away from them saint francis de sales saint vincent de paul saint chantal no i prefer saint francis of assisi saint bernard saint angela the mysticism of the 17th century is all the fashion with its emphatic and mean churches its pompous and icy painting its solemn poetry its gloomy prose but look he said my cell is still neither swept nor set in order and i'm afraid that in lingering here i may give some trouble to father Etienne. it rains however too hard to allow of my walking in the wood the simplest thing is to go and read the little office of our lady in the chapel he went down there it was at this hour almost empty the monks were at work in the fields or in the factory two fathers only on their knees before the altar of our lady were praying so absorbedly that they did not even hear the opening of the door and durtal who had placed himself near them opposite the porch which gave upon the high altar saw them reflected in the sheet of glass placed before the shrine of the blessed Guéry. this sheet had indeed the effect of a mirror and the white fathers were in the depths of it lived in prayers under the table in the very heart of the altar and he also appeared there in a corner reflected at the back of the shrine near the sacred remains of the monk at one moment he lifted his head and saw that the round window in the apse behind the altar reproduced on its glass ornamented with gray and blue the marks engraved on the reverse of the medal of saint benedict the first letters of its imperative formulas the initials of its distiches it might have been called an immense clear medal sifting a pale light straining it through prayers not allowing them to penetrate to the altar till sanctified and blessed by the patriarch and while he was dreaming the clock struck the two trappists regained their stalls while the others entered waiting thus in the chapel the hour of sext had struck the abbot advanced durtal saw him again for the first time since their conversation he seemed less ill less pale he marched majestically in his great white cowl at the hood of which hung a violet acorn and the fathers bowed kissing their sleeve before him he reached his place which was designated by a wooden cross standing before a stall and all enfolded themselves with a great sign of the cross bowed to the altar and the feeble imploring voice of the old trappist rose deus in adjutorum meum intende and the office continued in the monotonous and charming pitch of the doxology interrupted by profound reverences large movements of the arm lifting the sleeve of the cowl as it fell to the ground to allow the hand freedom to turn the pages when sext was over durtal went to rejoin the oblate they found on the table of the refectory a little omelette, leeks cooked in a sauce of flour and oil, haricots and cheese. It is astonishing, said Durtal, how in regard to mystics the world errs on preconceived ideas, on the old string. Phrenologists declare that mystics have pointed skulls. Now here, that their form is more visible than elsewhere, because they are all hairless and shaven, there are no more heads like eggs than anywhere else. I looked this morning at the shape of their heads, no two are alike some are oval and depressed others like a pear and straight some have lumps on them and some have none and it is just the same with faces when they are not transfigured by prayer they are ordinary if they did not wear the habit of their order no one could recognize in these trappists predestined beings living out of modern society in the full middle ages in absolute dependence on a god if they have souls which are not like those of other people 
they have after all faces and bodies like those of the first comer all is within said the oblate why should elect souls be enclosed in fleshly prisons different to others this conversation which continued on different points of trappist life ended by turning on death in a monastery and monsieur bruno revealed some details when death is near he said the father abbot traces on the ground a cross in blessed ashes covered with straw and the dying man is placed on it wrapped in serge cloth the brothers recite near him the prayers of the dying and at the moment of his death the response subvenite sancti dei is chanted in choir the father abbot incenses the body which is washed while the monks sing the office of the dead in another room then his regular habit is put on the dead monk and he is borne in procession to the church where he lies on a stretcher with his face uncovered until the hour destined for the funeral then on the way to the cemetery the community intones no longer the chant of the dead the psalms of grief and the sequences of regret but rather in exitu israel de aegypto which is the psalm of deliverance the free song of joy and the trappist is buried without a coffin in his robe of stuff his head covered with his hood lastly during thirty days his place remains empty in the refectory his portion is served as usual but the brother porter distributes it to the poor ah the happiness to die thus said the oblate as he ended for if one dies after having honestly fulfilled one's task in the order one is assured of eternal happiness according to the promises made by our lord to saint benedict and to saint bernard the rain is over said durtal i should like to visit today that little chapel at the end of the park of which you spoke to me the other day which is the shortest way to reach it monsieur bruno told him the way and durtal went off rolling a cigarette to gain the great pond thence he struck a path to the left and mounted a lane of trees he slipped on the wet ground and got on with difficulty at last however he gained a clump of chestnuts which he skirted behind these rose a dwarf tower topped by a very small dome pierced by a door to the left and right of this door on sockets where ornaments of the romanesque epoch still were seen under the velvety crust of moss two stone angels were still standing they belonged evidently to the burgundian school with their big round heads their hair puffed and divided into waves their fat faces with turned up noses their solid draperies with hard folds they also came from the ruins of the old cloister but the interior of the chapel was unfortunately thoroughly modern it was so small that the feet of him who knelt at the altar almost touched the wall at the entrance in a niche veiled by white gauze a virgin smiled with extended hands she had blue plaster eyes and apple-shaped cheeks she was wearisome in her insignificance but her sanctuary retained the warmth of places always shut up the walls hung with red calico were dusted the floor was swept and the holy water basins full superb tea roses flourished in pots between the candelabra durtal then understood why he had so often seen monsieur bruno walking in this direction with flowers in his hand he was going to pray in this place which he loved no doubt because it was isolated in the profound solitude of this trappist monastery excellent man cried durtal thinking over the affectionate services the fraternal care the oblate had had for him and he added he is a happy man too for he is self-contained and lives so placidly here and indeed he went on where is the good of striving if not against oneself to agitate oneself for money for glory to conduct oneself so as to keep others down and gain adulation from them how vain a task only the church in decking the temporary altars of the liturgical year in forcing the seasons to follow step by step the life of christ has known how to trace for us a plan of necessary occupations of useful ends she has given us the means of walking always side by side with jesus to live day by day with the gospels for christians she has made time the messenger of sorrows and the herald of joys she has entrusted to the year the part of servant of the new testament the zealous emissary of worship and durtal reflected on the cycle of the liturgy which begins on the first day of the religious year with advent then turns with an insensible movement on itself till it returns again to its starting point to the time when the church prepares by penitence and prayer to celebrate christmas and turning over his prayer book seeing the extraordinary circle of offices he thought of that prodigious jewel that crown of king ressesvant preserved in the museum of cluny 
the liturgical year was like it studded with crystals and jewels by its admirable canticles and its fervent hymns set in the very gold of benedictions and vespers it seemed that the church had substituted for that crown of thorns with which the jews had surrounded the temples of the saviour the truly royal crown of the proper of the seasons the only one which was chiselled in a metal precious enough with art pure enough to dare to place itself on the brow of a god and the grand lapidary had begun his work by encrusting in this diadem of offices the hymn of saint ambrose and the invocation taken from the old testament the rorate Curly, that melodious chant of expectation and regret that obscure gem violet colored the lustre declares itself then when after each of its stanzas rises the solemn prayer of the patriarchs calling for the longed-for presence of christ and the four sundays of advent disappeared with the turned pages of the prayer book the night of the nativity was come after the Jesu Redemptor of Vespers, the old Portuguese chant, the Adeste Fideles, arose at benediction from every lip. It was a sequence of a truly charming simplicity, an old carving wherein defiled the shepherds and the kings to a popular air appropriate to great marches, apt to charm, to aid by the somewhat military rhythm of its steps, the long lines of the faithful quitting their cottages to go to the distant churches in the towns and imperceptibly like the year in an invisible rotation the circle turned and stopped at the feast of the holy innocents where there flourished out like a flower from a slaughterhouse on a shoot culled from a soil irrigated by the blood of lambs this sequence red and smelling of roses the salvete flores martyrum of prudentius the crown moved again and the hymn of the epiphany the crudelis herodes of sedulius appeared in its turn now the sundays grew heavy the violet Sundays, when the Gloria in Excelsis is no more heard, when the Audi Benigne of Saint Ambrose is chanted, and the Miserere, that cinder-coloured psalm, which is perhaps the most perfect masterpiece which the Church has ever drawn from her storehouses of plain chants. It was Lent, when the amethysts fade in the moist grey of onyxes, in the embrowned white of quartz, and the magnificent invocation, Attende Domine, rose beneath the arches. Sprung like the Rorate Coeli from the sequences of the Old Testament, this humble and contrite chant, enumerating the deserved punishments of sins, became, if not more sorrowful, at all events more grave and more pressing when it confirmed, when it resumed in the initial stanza of its burthen, the avowal of shame already confessed. And suddenly on this crown there burst out after the expiring fires of Lent the flaming ruby of the Passion. On the upturned yellow of the sky a red cross was raised, while majestic shouts and despairing cries proclaimed the blood-stained fruit of the tree. And the Vexilla Regis was again repeated the following Sunday at the Feast of Palms, which joined to that sequence of Fortunatus the green hymn which it accompanied with a silky noise of palms, the Gloria Laus et Honor of Theodulf. Then the fires of precious stones grew grey and died. To the glowing coals of gems succeeded the dead cinders of obsidians, black stones scarcely swelling, without a gleam above the tarnished gold of their mountings. One ended now Holy Week. Everywhere the Pange Lingua and the Stabat Mater wailed under the arches. And then came the Tenebrae, the Lamentations and the Psalms, whose knell shook the flame of the brown waxen tapers. And after each halt, at the end of each of the Psalms, one of the tapers expired and its column of blue smoke evaporated still under the lighted circumference of the arches, while the choir recommenced the interrupted series of complaints. And the crown turned once more. The beads of this musical rosary still ran on, and all changed. Jesus had risen, and songs of joy issued from the organs. The victimae pascale laudes exulted before the gospel of the masses, and at the benediction of the Ophilii et Filii, created indeed to be intoned by the wild jubilation of crowds, ran and sported in the joyous hurricane of the organs, which uprooted the pillars and unroofed the naves. And the feasts rung in with bells followed at longer intervals. At ascension the heavy and clear crystals of Saint Ambrose filled with their luminous water the tiny basin of the gem sockets. The fire of rubies and garnets were lighted up again with the crimson hymn and scarlet sequence of Pentecost the Veni Creator and Veni Spiritus. The Feast of the Trinity passed, signalized by the stanzas of Gregory the Great, and for the Feast of the Blessed Sacrament, the liturgy could exhibit the most marvellous jewel case of its dower, 
the office of Saint Thomas, the Pange Lingua, the Adoro Te, the Sacre Solemnis, the Verbum Supernum, and above all the Lauda Sion, that pure masterpiece of Latin poetry and scholasticism, that hymn so precise, so lucid in its abstraction, so firm in its rhymed words, round which is rolled the melody perhaps the most enthusiastic, the most supple in plain chant. The circle displaced itself again, showing on its different faces the 23 to 28 Sundays which defile after Pentecost, the green weeks of the time of pilgrimage, and stopped at the last feast, at the Sunday after the octave of all saints, at the dedication of churches which the Caelistis Urps incensed, old stanzas of which the ruins were badly consolidated by the architects of Urban VIII, old jewels on which the troubled water slept and was reanimated only in rare lights. The juncture of the religious crown of the liturgical year was then made at the masses, in which the gospel of the last Sunday after Pentecost, the gospel according to St. Matthew, repeats, as well as the gospel according to St. Luke, recited on the first Sunday in Advent, the terrible predictions of Christ on the desolation of the time, on the end of the world. This is not all, Durtal continued, who was interested in this run through his prayer book. In this crown of the proper of the seasons are inserted, like smaller stones, the sequences of the proper of saints, which fill the empty places and finish the round of the circle. First, the pearls and gems of the Blessed Virgin, the limpid jewels, the blue sapphires and rose rubies of her antiphons. Then the aquamarine, so lucid and pure, of the Ave Maris Stella, the topaz, pale as tears, of the O Quot Undis Lacrimarum, on the Feast of the Seven Dolores, the hyacinth, the colour of dried blood, of the Stabat. Then were told the feasts of the angels and the saints, the hymns dedicated to the apostles and the evangelists, to the martyrs, whether solitary or in couples, both out of and during the Pascal season, to the confessors, pontiffs and non-pontiffs, to virgins, to holy women, all feasts differentiated by special sequences, by special proses of which some are very simple, like those stanzas made in honour of the Nativity of St. John the Baptist by Paul the Deacon. There still remains all saints, with the placare Christe and the three blows on the alarm bell, the knell in triplets of the Dies Irae, which resounds on the day set apart for the commemoration of the dead. What an immense fund of poetry, what an incomparable estate of art the church possesses, he cried, closing his book, and many memories rose for him at this excursion into his prayer book. On how many evenings had the sadness of life been dissipated in listening to these proses chanted in the churches? He thought over again of the suppliant voice of Advent, and recalled one evening when he had wandered under a fine rain along the quays. He had been driven from home by ignoble visions, and at the same time had been harassed by the increasing disgust of his vices. He had ended by being brought up against his will at Saint-Gervais. In the chapel of the Virgin, some poor women were prostrate. He had knelt, tired and dazed, his soul so ill at ease that he slumbered without power to wake himself. Some men and boys of the choir were installed in the chapel with two or three priests. They had lighted candles, and the voice, light and sustained, of a child, had in the dark of the church chanted the long antiphons of the Rorate. In the state of overwhelming sadness in which he was stagnant, Durtal felt himself open and bleeding to the bottom of his soul. Then a voice older and less trembling, which understood the words it said, narrated ingenuously, almost without confusion, to the just one. Pecavimus et factisumus tanquam imundus nos. And Durtal took up these words and spelt them over in terror, thinking, Ah, yes, we have sinned and become like the leprous, O Lord. And the chant continued, and in his turn, the Most High borrowed that same innocent organ of childhood to declare to man his pity, and to confirm to him the pardon assured by the coming of the Son. And the evening had ended by the benediction in plain chant, in the midst of the silence and prostration of unhappy women. Durtal remembered how he left the church refreshed, freed from his hauntings, and he had gone away in the drizzling rain, surprised that the way was so short, humming the rorate of which the air had taken possession of him, ending by seeing in it the personal touch of a kindly unknown. And there were other evenings. The octave of the Feast of All Souls at Saint-Sulpice and at St. Thomas Aquinas, where, after the Vespers of the Dead, they brought out again the old sequence which has disappeared from the Roman breviary, the Languentibus in Purgatorio, 
this church was the only one in paris which had retained these pages of the gallican hymnal and had them sung by two basses without a choir but these singers so poor as a rule no doubt were fond of this air for if they did not sing it without at least they put a little soul into its delivery and this invocation to the madonna in which she was adjured to save the souls in purgatory was as sorrowful as the souls themselves and so melancholy so languid that the surroundings were forgotten the ugliness of that sanctuary of which the choir was a theatre scene surrounded by closed dressing rooms and garnished with lustres one might think oneself for a few moments far from paris far from that population of devout women and servant girls which attend that place in the evening ah the church he said to himself as he descended the path which led to the great pond what a mother of art is she and suddenly the noise of a body falling into the water interrupted his reflections he looked behind the hedge of reeds and saw nothing but great circles running on the water and all at once in one of these rings a small dog-like head appeared holding a fish in its mouth the beast raised itself a little out of the water showed a thin body covered with fur and gazed on durtal quietly with its little black eyes then in a flash it passed the distance which separated it from the bank and disappeared under the grasses it is the otter he said to himself remembering the discussion at table between the stranger priest and the oblate and he went to gain the other pond when he encountered father etienne he told him his adventure impossible cried the monk no one has ever seen the otter you must have mistaken it for a water rat or some other animal for that beast for which we have watched for years is invisible durtal gave him a description of it it is certainly the otter admitted the guest master surprised it was evident that this otter lived in the pond in a legendary state in monotonous lives in days like those in a cloister it took the proportions of a fabulous subject of an event whereof the mystery would occupy intervals seized between prayers and offices we must point out to monsieur bruno the exact spot where you remarked it for he will begin to hunt it again said father etienne after a silence but how can it trouble you in eating your fish since you do not angle for them i beg your pardon we fish for them to send them to the archbishop answered the monk who went on still it is very strange that you saw the beast when i leave this thought durtal they will certainly speak of me as the gentleman who saw the otter while talking they had arrived at the cross pond look said the father pointing out the swan who rose in a fury beat his wings and hissed what is the matter with him the matter is that the white hue of my habit infuriates him ah oh, and why i do not know perhaps he wants to be the only one who is white here he spares the lay brothers while as for a father wait you will see and the guest master walked quietly towards the swan come he said to the angry creature who splashed him with water and he held out his hand which the swan snapped see said the monk showing the mark of a red pinch printed on the flesh and he smiled holding his hand and quitted durtal who asked himself whether in acting thus the trappist were not wishing to inflict on himself some corporal punishment to atone for some distraction the evening before some peccadillo that stroke of the beak must have pinched him horribly for the tears came into his eyes how could he expose himself with joy to such a bite and he remembered that one day at the office of none one of the young monks made a mistake in the tone of an antiphon at the moment that the office ended he knelt before the altar then he lay his whole length on the tiles on his face his mouth pressed on the ground till the stroke of the prior's bell gave him the order to get up this was a voluntary punishment for a negligence committed a forgetfulness who knows whether father etienne did not in his turn punish himself for a thought he deemed to border on sin in getting himself thus pinched he consulted the oblate on the point in the evening but monsieur bruno contented himself with a smile without answering and when durtal spoke to him of his speedy departure for paris the old man shook his head considering he said the fear and the discomfort that communion caused you you would act wisely if you approached the holy table immediately on your return and seeing that durtal did not reply but hung his head believe a man who has known these trials if you do not force yourself while you are still under the warm impression of la trappe you will float between desire and regret without advancing you will be ingenious in discovering excuses for not making your confession you will try to think it impossible to find in paris an abbe who understands you
Now, allow me to assure you nothing is more false. If you desire an expert and easy confidant, go to the Jesuits. If you wish above all a zealous souled priest, go to Saint-Sulpice. You will find there honest and intelligent ecclesiastics, excellent hearts. In Paris, where the clergy of the parishes are so mixed, they are at the top of the basket of the priesthood, and as may be imagined, they form a community, live in cells, do not dine out. And as the Sulpician rule forbids them to aspire to honours or places, they do not run the chance of becoming bad priests by ambition. Do you know them? No. But to resolve that question which in fact constantly troubles me, I count on a priest whom I often see, on the very man who in fact sent me into this Trappist monastery. And that, he went on, makes me remember, and he rose to go to Compline, that I have as yet forgotten to write to him. It is true that now it is too late. I should arrive at his house almost as soon as my letter. It is strange, but by force of walking in one's own, by force of living to oneself, the days run by, and there is no time to do anything here. End of part two, chapter seven.